Let me just begin by saying to each and every one of you, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the sacrifice you made in order to be here. Thank you for putting up with the rain, although the rain has its own symbolism. We know a lot of times when people have rain on their wedding day, although they don't like it, it's said to be a sign of God's blessing. So, and I'm lucky standing here in a beautiful big umbrella, but thank you very much. And of course, thank you is a totally appropriate thing for us to do, uh, particularly on a Sunday, particularly on a Sunday that we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because remember that it's still Easter. This wonderful tradition we have of the octave of Easter in which every single day, all the eight days beginning on Easter Sunday, right through Divine Mercy Sunday, are part of the same liturgical day. Today is Easter, and we're celebrating with thanksgiving the sacrifice, the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And of course, we know that Mass in Greek, all of you who know your Greek, you know, what is the Greek word for Mass? It is Eucharist, Eucharistia, and it's from the verb to give thanks. This is what we do. It's the most appropriate action of love that we can give. Every human being likes to be thanked. Isn't it true? Every human being. And God is no exception because God's a real person. And God loves to give. And God loves that we receive those gifts and that we appreciate them with gratitude. So today, I would like to see as a day of gratitude to give thanks to the Lord for his blessing, for touching our hearts. Has he touched your heart? I hope so, because I have to tell you something. Uh, I want to tell you something else, too. Because even if, even if there are still some things in your heart that are unsettled, that are not at peace, that aren't right, even if there's some memories there, even if there are something that troubles you now, maybe in a relationship, maybe something that happened in the past, maybe in a bad memory, I want you to know that it's no obstacle for the Lord to get in there. You see, this is also a feast of the heart. We're in the presence of the heart of the Curie of ours, of St. John Vianney, who had the wonderful heart of a priest who was constantly surrounded by sin. Constantly, most of his life, he was surrounded by oppression, by sin, and by all sorts of griefs and anxieties. People came to him in droves, just loaded down with all their fears and anxieties and confusions and feelings of being somehow separate from God and from the people that they loved. And they came to him and they piled all of that on him, on his little heart, because God had given him the wonderful commission, power as a priest to absolve sins that we heard Jesus give his apostles today and their successors. He was able to say, I absolve you from your sin. But here's the point. They felt drawn to the Lord through this wonderful sacrament of peace, even though they were still aware that they may have been loaded down by sin. And that's the beauty of divine mercy, is that God doesn't wait until we're ready to come to God. God comes to us while we're still in our sins, while we're still struggling where well, we still find it difficult at times to believe. I think we can all identify with Thomas to some extent. We don't know why he wasn't there. Why wasn't he there the first time when Jesus appeared in the upper room? Oh, maybe he had something better to do. Maybe he had some shopping to be done. I don't know. Maybe he was having some trouble with these crazy people that were saying that we saw the risen Lord, didn't believe them for some reason. Maybe he just couldn't deal with it yet. Or just maybe he was feeling guilt because he was one of those that wasn't there at the end when Jesus died, like all of the others pretty much so, except for John and, and Mary. Maybe he just felt this was over now. Maybe he trusted his own instincts too much. You know, this is the way life ends. Life ends in death. When it's over, it's over. You know, in, in the long run, it's death and not life that has the final say. The world is a rotten place. It's not going to be getting any better. We know the way it works. That's the real world. That's reality. And all he saw when Jesus died on the cross, or when he heard he died on the cross from the others, and not that he believed, Jesus was really dead. 
that fit in with his vision of reality? I'm just speculating, you know. Maybe, maybe that is one of the things that at times fits in with our vision of reality. And, and the surprise suddenly of hearing that Jesus is risen, he couldn't cope with that just yet. So we can understand it. But you have to give him a little credit too because he did come back. And he had the courage, I say God-given, to say, I want to see Jesus. I want to see the wounds in his side. I want to believe. Oh, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. It's a reminder to us that even in our doubts, even in our anxieties, even in our oppression, even in our fear, that's the one time we most need to turn to the Lord. Isn't it funny that sometimes when we've sinned, when we've got into a habit of sin, when we become depressed, when we feel nobody loves us anymore, but let me just stop right there. When I feel nobody loves me anymore. I'm going to tell you something I learned from a nun, or at least heard from a nun. I didn't learn it, but I heard it when I was in grammar school. I remember her saying around the Easter season, remember, Jesus loves you enough that if you were the only person in the world, he would have died for you. Do you believe that? Jesus would have died for you if you were the only person in the world. And that means everybody sitting in the last rows over there too. That means all of us, all of us, even priests, he loves us too. And, and my special love to my brother priests who are here too because we are in the presence with, as you know, the one who is the patron of all parish priests, the curie of ours, because his priestly heart never tired, never tired of hearing the sins and the struggles of the people that came to him because he knew Jesus had put him there for that purpose. And even though that burden must have been great, 16, 18 hours in the confessional, he never lost sight of that because he knew that Jesus loved him and had chosen him for this task. I remember I had an experience like that in my own personal life, not quite like this, but I had the benefit of a very good Catholic education. I had wonderful sisters in school, the Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur. And I remember, I remember that uh, I had learned my catechism pretty well, but I wasn't evangelized. I believed somehow that being a Catholic meant you have to try real hard to be good. And if you were good, God would be nice to you. And if you were bad, God would be ticked means God would be angry, and he would move away in some way. You know, have you felt that way sometimes? Have you felt guilty sometimes? And maybe God, maybe I'm not being good enough. But see, part of the problem was the way I was, and I have to say it this way, the way I was dealing with God. I wasn't trusting God to be God. What I was doing was I was saying, Lord, help me to be a little bit better, realizing that I needed a lot of improvement in my life. And so I said, you know what, instead of just giving you 50%, maybe I'll give you 60%. I'll do it 60% your way and maybe 40% my way. Let's, come on, let's just negotiate this a little bit. Let's be pals. And little by little, I was, okay, maybe during Lent, you, you feel a little bit holier. I said, okay, maybe I'm going to give 80% during Lent, you know. But I want to hold on to 20% of my stuff, you know. Let me deal with it my own way. And what I came to realize is I was not treating God like God. I was not treating Jesus like Jesus. I was treating him just like a pal, you know, like an equal. So maybe we could just get along together, you know? Can't we all just get along, you know? And no wonder it's so difficult for the Lord to get through because it's that 20% that's all about me and all about my deals that really needs to be healed. That's the door that needs to be broken down. That's the door of mercy that the Lord wants to pierce through so he can remove that part of myself that still holds back, that still wants to hold on to my own sins, my own attitudes, my own prejudices, my own habits, my own past, my own definition of who I am, and not to see myself in the light of God's love. And I remember sitting at a kitchen table one time with a priest friend of mine, a young priest friend of mine who had his own struggles in his life. And I remember it was a particularly difficult time in my life. I think I was in my mid-30s, and I was studying in postgraduate school, and I was wondering, why am I doing this? You know, uh, why, why, what is God asking? And I kind of expected a lecture from him because I was complaining, you know, like Thomas was complaining. Something wrong. My faith isn't completely what it should be. I, I, and I knew that. 
And uh, I remember him looking at me with a smile and saying, well, don't you know that God loves you? Now, I had heard that before, but I, did I really believe that in my heart? Because here's the thing. We can know things about Jesus. We can know things about divine mercy. And we can tell people how wonderful it is. We can tell people how to pray the chaplet. We can have a beautiful picture of the divine mercy in our home. And we could even go through many, many sacrifices in our lives. But unless you or I believe that that divine mercy is for me personally. See, this is what evangelization is all about. You know, it's a big word, and a lot of times it sounds like. It doesn't mean beating people over the head with the Bible. It doesn't mean reading the Ten Commandments to them. Everybody knows them anyway. They're in our hearts. We basically know what's right and wrong. The problem is we don't always do it. And the reason we don't is because we don't trust the only one that can help us to do that. We think we're all on our own, and then we feel lonely, and nobody loves us, and nobody cares. And we bring this on ourselves, we take this burden, and Jesus is saying, you know, let me into your heart. Let me get in there and relieve those doubts. Let me give you the mercy. See, it may be one of the reasons Thomas found it difficult to believe the word of the apostles and the first disciples was because they themselves may not have been evangelized. And it wasn't until Jesus said to them in the upper room, your sins are forgiven, and whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. You know, imagine the position they might have felt themselves in after having really abandoned their Lord and Savior. Wouldn't they have expected that he would come back pretty angry, pretty ticked? pretty upset, and that's not, but that's not the way Jesus approaches sinners. He doesn't approach us with a scowl, but with a welcoming smile, like he did with the woman at the well, like the prodigal son approaching his father, looking for him to come back, embraces him when he comes. So the Lord embraces us. Maybe they had not yet been evangelized to believe that Jesus loved them personally and forgave them. And that's why they needed divine mercy. That's why we need divine mercy. It's one thing to believe and to profess that Jesus suffered, died, and rose for the whole world. It's another thing to believe that Jesus suffered and died and rose for you and me so that each and every one of us has a future with him in heaven and with one another redeemed. And that's why divine mercy is the capstone. Pope Francis uh, has often spoken about the divine mercy. He speaks of it as the beating heart of the gospel. And what's the gospel? What does gospel mean? You know, you learn it in school, you, you preach it perhaps. Gospel means good news. Well, what's the good news? The good news, yes, it's that Jesus is the savior of the world, the savior of us all, that he's everyone's savior, we know that. But the good news is even more importantly, that he saves each and every one of us one by one, you and me personally. And when that gospel hits my heart, then and only then can I become an evangelizer, a person who is on fire with that love. And that's the love that Jesus wants us all to have today so that we truly can go into the world and tell the good news. Because it's not just the good news that somebody else received, but it's the good news that I received in my heart, and my heart is full of joy. Now, if, if you're not feeling that right now, don't get upset, relax. It's not just a feeling. It's not just about warm fuzzies. It's not just about being able to say, you know, uh, I see Jesus in my orange juice glass and wherever I go and things like that. No, it's not. It's, sometimes people characterize, you know, car caricature, they make a mockery of people, the come to Jesus moment you hear about. It, it's not just about that. It's not just about shouting and screaming that. It's about really trusting and believing that, that we have this incredible loving God that wants to enter our hearts and wants to stay there so that we truly become tabernacles of the Holy Spirit. Now, what does that mean? Me, a tabernacle of the Holy Spirit? That's another old-fashioned saying that I remember the sisters telling us, that all of us are meant to be tabernacles of the Holy Spirit. But I know I'm not worthy. 
And I know all of these sins that I don't even want to admit myself. And I know my past, and I know my problems, and I know my temptations and my proclivities and all of those kind of things. But still, see, that is, that is not an obstacle for the Lord. That's exactly why he came. In fact, as we hear in the scriptures, St. Paul tells us where, where sin is on the rise, where sin increases, grace abounds all the more the loving grace of God. Jesus is attracted to sinners, not their sins, because he knows they're burdening them. But he goes out of his way to be with us, particularly when we're struggling the most. So if you're going through a dark period of your life, if you're worried about the world, worried about your family, worried about your health, worried about your parish, worried about your neighbor, whatever it is, whatever the source of fear and anxiety and grief, that's exactly where Jesus wants to be with you right now because he knows that you're struggling with that and he wants to be with you and that's why he's here and he wants you to know that. That's the message of divine mercy and not just today but every day of our lives. Lord Jesus, I trust in you. Lord Jesus, I trust in you. It's a wonderful thing to say. Even if you wake up 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning and you're worried about the taxes and worried about everything else, Lord Jesus, I trust in you. Imagine him looking at you with love and let him into your heart. That's the message that Jesus has for each and every one of us today. And it's the message that we are going to celebrate in a special way in a few moments as I will bless you with the heart a blessed Saint John Vianney, who had the wonderful heart of that priest and gave to us by his ministry an example of what in some way all of us can be as ministers of mercy to bring that light into the world that is sometimes so full of darkness. It can only come if you and I are personally convicted of the knowledge and belief that you and I are loved deeply. And I go right back to what I said at the very beginning that I learned when I was in grammar school, but I think it went in one ear and out the other, that Jesus loves each and every one of you and me personally enough to die for us, even if you or I were the only person in the world. We have here the heart of John Vianney with us and brought by the Knights of Columbus from the shrine of Saint John Vianney in Ars, France. The relic is the incorrupt heart of this saint. And as I mentioned, Saint John Vianney is the patron saint of priests. So I want in a special way, because he prayed for priests, that this blessing to touch the heart of all of our priests to know his special love for them, because we love them, don't we? And we need them to bring God's mercy to us. This is also a, a visible icon, an image of the heart of Jesus. St. John's heart is a model for priests. Since St. John Vianney spent countless hours in the confessional, in Eucharistic adoration, and with people of all walks of life. He's the model priest for all priests. So let us invoke St. John Vianney's intercession in praying St. Faustina's prayer for priests. O oh my Jesus, I beg you on behalf of the whole church, grant it love and light, the light of your spirit, and give power to the words of priests so that hardened hearts might be brought to repentance and return to you, O Lord. Lord, give us holy priests. You yourself maintain them in holiness. O divine, great high priest, may the power of your mercy accompany them everywhere and protect them from the devil's traps and snares, which are continually being set for the souls of priests. May the power of your mercy, O Lord, shatter and bring to naught all that might tarnish the sanctity of a priest, for you can do all things. Amen. 
through the intercession of St. John Vianney, patron of priests, I bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.